Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. Before we get started, we always want to remind you that our description and show notes has a few things in there. We have links to the resources that we use for research. So if you want to do some more reading on the story or sometimes there's various footage and videos, we will link those in the show notes. We always have links to some resources for things like domestic violence, uh, 12-step programs, some mental health resources. If you uh, need access to those, we have links. And we have links to our social media. So if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which we're all pretty active over there, then check out those links. The last thing that we have is our links to our Patreon and our Threadless. So if you want some small merch items like stickers and magnets and stuff like that, and some access to bonus episodes and extra content, those will be on Patreon. And if you want bigger items like shirts and phone cases and mugs, those are on our Threadless. So the links for those are in the show notes. And we wanted to say thank you to a few new Patreon supporters this week. So we wanted to say thank you to new patrons, Flora, Alexandra, Evelyn, Diana, and Lindsay. So thanks, you guys. We appreciate your support on Patreon. Thanks, everybody. So with all that said, I think that we can get into our case for this week. We are still on letter B for bikers. Again, I'm already sick of them, but we're still on letter B, honestly. You're sick of them? (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm looking at you and I'm like, if I'm sick of them, I can't imagine how over it you are because you're so so immersed. I was so naive to come into this. Yeah. We're like, yeah, bikers will be a great subject. And then first weekend, I'm like, oh my God, this is way too heavy. It'll write itself. This is terrible. Right? Yeah. That's what I thought. Oh, it's got everything in one place. Yeah. These are going to be interesting stories. Equally crazy, different states. I mean, it's got it all. And then I'm just exhausted. I know. Me too. Me too. It's a lot of hate too. So this is the last one. That's the thing that's striking to me. Yeah. And I've, I've said it, I think, on our social media a little bit where yeah. I'm just like, I feel kind of naive that I didn't realize how incredibly prejudiced and racist, homophobic, all of that the biker world is, especially the one percenters. It's not every single person riding a motorcycle, but a lot of these stories, you start looking into them and there's just all these flags and symbols and Nazi stuff and Confederate stuff. And it is overwhelming how often you find that as an aspect of the biker stories. I feel like I knew that going into it. I I knew the foundation of it. You know, there was a lot of race and a lot of hate. Um, But this is also a testament to how good of a job they do covering their tracks about it because so many people, you know, oh, that's how it used to be. The olden days, right? You know, back at Hell's Angels, Altamont. Oh, it's different. It's different now. But I think that it's just a testament to really how good they are at covering themselves up. I feel like they can't exactly have PR teams, but there's definitely a campaign to keep this quiet. There are definitely PR teams. They just aren't called that. They're just right. called, you know, the sergeant at arms guy who they all have these double lives. And yeah. it's just really bizarre. Like they're super straight laced, but then they murder people on the side. They're just covering up everything and making us think with Santa toy runs that they're, you know, just here for their families to ride bikes. Yeah, it was interesting. We got a message from a listener who actually said that they had worked with a one percenter in, you know, a high position kind of thing. They were giving seminars and whatnot, and they had a one percent tattoo on their neck. And nobody else realized that that meant that this person was an outlaw, except for the person that sent me the message. Whoa. And it's like, I really do think they do a pretty good job of covering up the fact that they're often in high positions or, you know, careers with a lot of influence and power, but they fly under the radar because of their, whatever they call their PR team. I wonder what kind of seminars it was. Was it like timeshares? <laughs> was it like, you know, self-help? It, it would it be sounded, amazing. Um, it was medical field. Uh, oh, what? Yes. Oh, Okay. <laughs> All right. 
So when they have those tattoos, if they're thrown out, you either have to, it's either got to be blowtorched off of them or grinded off or cut out. Mm. So he's an active member. Yes. Because they would have taken it off of him. Yeah. Pulled his patch. <sighs> ah. Oh, it's so gross. Ah. It's so gross. Okay. Yeah, there's so much. So I did not exactly expect that going into these stories. Bikers, fun. <laughs> so now we've got another one this week. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but I made this one honestly a little bit shorter. I was like, okay, I can't have another two hour episode because I'm I'm going to lose my mind. So we've got one that's pretty interesting and kind of high profile, but I haven't gone into the minutia of 20 different members, you know? It's pretty high profile because when I mentioned it to somebody today, they were just like, oh my God, taco? Yeah. Okay. I got this. Like, <laughs> right. I know exact. Oh yeah. I've seen that episode. Like, knew immediately. Oh, he's my boy. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> okay. Let's let's do this. Yeah, it's a pretty crazy story. So we're going to focus on a gang called the Outlaws this week. And the Outlaws were founded in a bar outside Chicago in 1935. And they are believed to be the world's oldest one percenter biker club. They were the originals. Since they began in 1930s, the Outlaws have grown to over 1,700 members across 176 chapters. They're fully international. They're everywhere. The Outlaws gang has grown so big and powerful that the feds actually include them in what they call, quote, the Big Four MCs. And the Big Four is the Pagans, the Hells Angels, the Outlaws, and the Banditos. No, I think it's also easy to put like one and one, two together that we're in Chicago in the 30s, prohibition. Yes. What's an easy way to outrun the cops? Motorcycles, gangs of people that can split off and go whichever way, underground tunnels, you know, crazy. Who knows? Let's think out of the box, right? That's where these bikers are coming from. Right. That's what they were born out of. That's what this club came from. Yeah, and you'll see that going forward, they always maintained a little bit of mafia ties and stuff like that. And I think that's partly because they had the genesis in that era and that place. The mob has a pretty good outline. Yeah. Right? So I also want to point out that the big four, we're doing three episodes about bikers and we're covering three different gangs because the first episode we did was Hell's Angels. The second one was Banditos. And this week is Outlaws. So these are definitely the top most violent 1% motorcycle clubs. And we've barely even touched because I, it's like off the top of my head. There's like 10 other groups that I yes. can think of. Yeah. And they all just want to fight for territory. And these are the ones that actually just rise to the top of that. It seems like the smaller or mid-sized clubs are affiliates of, let's say, Hells Angels or the uh, allies with the Banditos and stuff like that. So exactly. these are the big four. Yep. While a number of other biker gangs fight for control of drug trafficking between Mexico and America, the outlaws have stayed up north towards the Great Lakes area and they've held steady control of the drug trade crossing the Canadian border. So they kind of let the other gangs fight down south for that drug territory. And they maintain a pretty big stronghold up towards the northern border. The Outlaws Constitution says that all members must have an American-made bike of a certain size. And also says that they have a whites-only membership policy. Oh, I'm shocked. We're just, I feel naive that I didn't know all this, but every single club that we've covered has that kind of policy. Their civil rights policies aren't, they're not woke at all. I'm so surprised. It's pretty bad. It's crazy to me that this still exists. In addition to the normal patches worn on biker jackets, they also have certain tattoos signifying various details about their place within the club and the certain things that they have done for the club. So an outlaw member who commits murder, attempts murder, or explodes a bomb on behalf of the outlaws is entitled to wear what they call lightning bolts, which came up in one of our other episodes, is actually a Nazi SS-style tattoo. I mean, I feel like these are very recycled ideas 
from all the other clubs. It's all the same shit. It's all the same SS bolts on this. However, since these guys started in the 30s, maybe they have a technicality that they're the first, but it's nothing original. No. It's just recycled hatred and systematic. That's all it is. Yeah. An outlaw who has gone to jail gets an LL tattoo, which stands for Lounge Lizard. And then the rest of the gang commits to supporting them financially and writing them letters or visiting while they're locked up. That's nice. It's funny that they're a lounge lizard. They're just chilling off to the side. Taking a break. That's what they call it. The outlaws were allied with the banditos from Texas, but they do not get along with the pagans and the warlocks. But their biggest enemy is the Hell's Angels. The outlaws actually have slogans like A-H-A-M-D, which stands for All Hell's Angels Must Die. And also they often say Adios, which stands for Angels Die in Outlaws States. Uh, It's so original and smart. I can imagine them coming up with that, like writing it on a chalkboard or something and thinking they're the smartest dudes in the whole fucking world. They are. They're just like, this is the best idea I've ever had. It's really, Adios. It's really stupid and funny to me at the same time. There's an episode of Gangland. It's season two, episode three, I believe. It's called Biker Wars. And they have a whole section about lists. They write it down. You've got all the acronyms and everything. And it's pretty good. They explain a lot of it. But it's all stupid. It's all so dumb. Yeah. And they just like... <laughs> recite it and stand by it like it's the smartest most philosophical best thing that's ever happened you know and we're not like making fun of it but it's just the seriousness that no i'm comes making fun of it. it fuck them okay <laughs> but it you know it's like i i understand you know there's this stupid crap but i mean come on yeah the thing is is like i'm not shitting on bikers in general But these outlaw gangs, I have no patience for any sort of racism, hatred, that kind of shit is not okay with me. So I don't care. I'm going to make fun of you. You know, like you're a piece of shit. If you don't want to be held accountable and mocked for your actions, then don't be a jackass. Well, sure. You know, like you have a choice. You chose to be a racist piece of shit. So fuck you. This is true. That's my that's my feeling on it. I just I know that there are plenty of normal I mean relatively normal people that are bikers, you know, quote unquote. But uh, yeah, you know, these outlaw one percenters that are rocking SS bolts with like skull and cross with pistons and shit, which they're getting inspiration from the Wild One movie with Marlon Brando. Right. Which <sighs> He's just wearing like leather through the whole thing. That's the only thing that makes him a biker. Yeah, that's really it. So it's just all funny to me. Yeah, it just, it's very stupid. It's just a style. It's just whatever. But it is, like you said, it's important to point out there's a difference between people that ride motorcycles or people that are in motorcycle clubs versus the one percenters we're talking about. And that's where I'm just like, fuck one percenters. We've obviously seen most of them are racist. They have these antiquated laws or whatever. And a lot of them are violent. They live on the outside the norms of society. The fringe. So stay out there. Yeah, that's theirs. They can stay in the fringe. So the person we're talking about this week is Harry Joseph Bowman, who is known as Taco. And he held various positions in the outlaws ranks in his home state of Michigan. Harry was given the nickname Taco because of his dark skin and features that the other members said made him look Latino. But don't you have to be white? But technically, this is the thing is they're making fun of him for looking like a minority, but he's not. He's he is a white guy. He's just olive skinned. It's just ridiculous. So ridiculous. Harry was first promoted to regional president, then became the national vice president. Then in 1984, the outlaws current president, Harold Stairway Harry Henderson, had to step down from the position because he was having some legal troubles. And at that point, Harry Taco took over the highest position of international president of the outlaws. 
Harry Taco, this is a joke, right? I know. I feel so juvenile, but every time I was writing it, great. I was just like, Harry Taco. Just chuckling to myself. And I'm like, God, Brianna, you're smarter than this. Like, like, that, but it's so amusing. I don't care. I like stupid humor. <laughs> it's like where they got the idea for Pink Taco, all these right. restaurants, these stupid, you know, Harry Oyster, shit like this, right? Great biker name. Throughout his 13 years as president, Harry seemed to live a double life. And he moved really easily between the biker world and straight society. So during the day, he shuttled his kids from their affluent Detroit suburb to their expensive private school in a chauffeured, armor-plated, bulletproof Cadillac. This sounds like the gaudy childhood. Really, it is. 100%. It very much reminded me of Mafia. And when I hear the descriptions of him, I often think like Tony Soprano. He's like a petite Tony Soprano. Every time I just kept thinking like La Casa Nostra. It's all mob related. Yes. He really, really took so much from the mob. And just put it into a biker gang. Yeah, the parallels there are just crazy because he is so charming. He got along with everyone and kind of flew under the radar got away with a lot of things. He tailored his appearance to different situations. And when he needed to kind of blend seamlessly into the legitimate world, he made sure that he had a fresh haircut, a clean shave, and he covered up the swastika tattoo on his forearm with a nice suit. But then, after hours, he oversaw lucrative drug deals, planned bombings of other biker clubhouses or hangouts, And he ordered hits on various bikers. He's the scariest one of all because he can just assimilate and move between the two so like fluidly. There's something about that that's definitely a little bit terrifying. Definitely. Because he he fully flies under the radar. He also in the Gangland episode, especially there's episode uh, there's scenes where he's wearing this long black cape with a swastika at the bottom near the ankles. That's like his signature dress. They're like, oh, yeah, that was him in his cape. Whoa. Floor length cape with like a hood and this giant swastika like near the ankles. Oh, that, that I did his, not know. That was his gear. And it's probably a good idea to like cover the Nazi regalia on your forearm. What? It's just how he moved so seamlessly. It's just interesting. He's the scariest. It's very weird to me that he could just cover that up and blend in. It's not very biker of you either to really like cover up your bikerness. Yeah, it seems like bikers wouldn't care. If you're really this outlaw tough guy, you would just be you and fuck everyone else. Interesting. So Taco forged partnerships with the Italian mafia, like we said, and also Eastern European gangs. And this was basically a move to just grow his power in the criminal underworld. And at the same time, he still cultivated relationships with politicians, judges, law enforcement, and other wealthy influencers in the legit business world. So he really was making these uh, partnerships and friendships and deep relationships with people within both sides of the law. Really powerful people. He's going to be his own like Teflon Don. Exactly. I mean, gaudy playbook. Because Harry was such a chameleon and had such high aspirations, he was able to lead the outlaws beyond the typical biker businesses like bars and strip clubs, tattoo shops, drug dealing, all that kind of stuff they normally did. He always traveled with a couple bodyguards who carried guns, although Taco himself would not carry a firearm. And I think (laughs) this is just trying to not be caught, you know, or something I don't think that he's like afraid of having a gun, but I think that not having a gun on him allows him. Right. And he can't have the gun. So if he gets caught, like everyone else can have one, but he can't. Yeah. I think there's definite tactical moves for him having bodyguards that are armed, but not being armed himself. Sure. For sure. For most of Taco's time as president, a man named Wayne Joe Black Hicks was his number two. Wayne had agreed to do a hit on a former outlaw member who had left the gang on bad terms. And after seeing Wayne's dedication to the club, Harry promoted him to lead a chapter in Florida. And over a short period of time, Wayne's role grew to eventually become Harry's right-hand man and most trusted lieutenant. 
In the early 90s, the Warlocks began selling drugs for the Hells Angels in Florida, and the outlaws wanted to put a stop to it. Taco had heard that a former outlaw named Raymond Bear Chafin had left the gang and then reaffiliated with the Warlocks, which of course was a huge betrayal to the outlaws. Wayne enlisted the help of a new member, Alex Dirt Anchorick, to gather information about Raymond Bear Chafin. Once Alex had all the intel, Harry and Wayne convinced Alex to carry out the murder by himself so that they could be seen in public at the time and have an alibi. How do you do that? How does Alex agree to that? Yeah. I don't understand. Like, how, how do you convince someone to do that? What do you say? I have no how idea. How does that conversation go? Like, we'll give you a cookie? You know, like, what is the motivating factor here? Because it just seems like there's nothing in it for Alex. No. Because they're just going to go be somewhere out in public, have a perfect alibi, not take a charge while Alex is leaving himself vulnerable to be caught. Alex is known as dirt. Well, so there is that. I don't think he's the best at maybe, weighing out pros, cons of yeah. this situation. Yeah, probably not. So they provided Alex with a gun. And on February 21st, 1991, Alex went to find Raymond and earn his lightning bolt tattoo. Alex followed Raymond to his home and snuck up on him while he was working on his bike in the garage. He shot him four times in the head execution style before running off to flee the scene. Raymond's murder would be an unsolved case for years to come. And like we've talked about before, it's just this code of silence. So even if anyone had an inkling of who had done it, they wouldn't talk about it. There's just trails of bodies behind all these clubs too. Just mysterious ends. They're not mysterious, but you know, there's Mysterious foul play. enough to not be solved. There's foul play involved, and they just don't know who or what. It's really sad. None of these families have closure, you know? Yeah. In March 1992, during Daytona Bike Week, there was some tension between bikers at an outlaw-zoned bar during, actually, a wet t-shirt contest, of all things. I don't know who can fight at a time like that. There's there's titties everywhere. Why are you not happy? Stop fighting. Priorities, folks. Right. What the fuck? Yeah. I mean, you're at a, what? I know. I don't get it at all. I can't I can't be mad at all when there's titties. That's who all could? I'm saying. Bikers pissed wet t-shirt contest. Right. Doesn't add up. <laughs> a lower level outlaw probate named Erwin Hitler Nyson started throwing punches at the president of the Outlaws Atlanta chapter named James Moose McLean. When Harry heard about the fight, he ordered that Irwin be brought to him immediately. Outlaws members put a lock on his bike, and when Irwin was found the next morning, he was immediately brought to Harry's hotel room. So Harry punched him, immediately pulled a knife, and threatened to kill him because he was so upset that he had dared to pick a fight with an outlaw's leader. Eventually, Harry decided to take a back seat in the conflict and he ordered just his fellow outlaws to continue beating him up. When Harry became bored of the whole situation, he instructed the guys to carry Irwin over to the balcony and then throw him off of it. Despite taking a severe beating and falling three stories, Erwin Hitler Nyssen survived his injuries. I know he's a victim. I would never make fun of victims. But this guy's nickname is Hitler. He's still out on the streets. I like when I read this, it's a hairy taco tried to take out Hitler. <laughs> it's like, what is this sentence that we're like, saying? Out what loud? are we doing? How Adults. does this make sense? These are adult grown men mm -hmm. that have not, I guess, not regular lives. But I mean, they're doing stuff. They're passing people to the grocery store. They're going to parent teacher conferences at some point or they're sending their old lady to them. It's crazy. But how the fuck? So weird. But it seems that Harry's violence, even towards his own club members, didn't scare members off or make the outlaws turn on him. 
I guess they kind of stood behind him and felt he was justified. In fact, it was kind of the opposite. Not only did they not turn on him and get upset by these kind of things, but his aggressive, heavy-handed leadership, combined with this kind of charming charisma he had and the dedication to the club, made people really respect him even more. And they had this completely unwavering loyalty. Must have just been like exciting. Just exciting. They don't really have to do anything, but this guy is crazy. So it's just exciting to be around. Yeah, and I think that they were just really inspired by there's so much like brotherhood and family kind of stuff. Like you stand by this loyalty towards your fellow members. And I think people really admired that about him was he was willing to go to any length to protect the club, its members, the reputation of the outlaws, all that stuff. And people respected it. He lived the life like he talked the talk and he lived it. He walked the walk. So he was the example. Exactly. He was the biker goals. (laughs) Hashtag biker goals. That's terrible. (laughs) (laughs) As a result of this like extreme loyalty that the members of the outlaws had for Harry, it was also particularly difficult for law enforcement to get any information on Taco and nearly impossible to get the outlaw members to cooperate and turn informant which was pretty rare. Usually, you know, you can find someone that's got some sort of grudge or beef that's willing to turn at some point. But it seems like from what they described that he had a pretty low percentage of people betraying him. That is until 1993, when an outlaw named Kevin Turbo Tally had been hit with some charges in Ontario, and he wanted to get his sentence reduced. So he ended up signing this document in Canada admitting that the outlaws were actually indeed a criminal enterprise. When he was released from jail, he was ordered to report to Detroit for a meeting with Taco and the other outlaws leadership. When he landed in Michigan, he was kidnapped from the airport and then held captive for five days in an isolated room at the Outlaws Detroit clubhouse. Over the course of the next five days, he was humiliated, beaten, tortured, and even sodomized. They informed him that he was kicked out of the club, and they took his Outlaws jacket before putting him back on a plane to Canada. Here's my thing about some of these biker things, some of the mafia stuff that has in common is there's people that are asked to come to these meetings and they always go. If anyone said to me, hey, come to Detroit, I know you're in Canada, but I really need to talk to you, I would know immediately I'm getting murdered. We saw it in the Shedden Massacre. We're seeing it here. I mean, that's a typical biker tactic and a mafia tactic. And you know that these people are blowing shit up and, you know, I mean, the stuff that they're doing, they call a meeting and people die. So and if you're the only one called to that yeah. meeting and you know you just signed this document, you, I mean, now is the time to be on the run, they not to show up for a meeting. Up. They just keep showing up. Again, it's like I don't want to victim blame, but I'm just like, you got to you got to know the situation you're in. Like, there's no way he should have been on that plane. Maybe they think they can talk their way out of it. Maybe. Or like, you know, oh, well, he wouldn't do that to me, even though he's done to seven other people at these other meetings. But he's not going to do that to me. Yeah, it's so delusional. But maybe that's what they thought. They have to be. Because why else are you going to this? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's completely illogical. And you know you're going to be in danger. So on New Year's Eve 1993... Harry called another meeting of all outlaws at a party in Fort Lauderdale. During the meeting, Taco announced that the outlaws would be turning up the violence in 1994 and would particularly target the Hells Angels and any smaller clubs affiliated with the Hells Angels. I think this is kind of funny, though. They're just like, 1994, it's coming. It's going to be our year. This is the one. Stay tuned. Like, yeah. This is the year that Taco just steps this shit up. 
you know they were pumped up at that meeting. Taco's got like hype men behind him. He's got his cape on. Yes. He's got his cape on. He's got flags out everywhere. They're probably just branding people like, come on down. We got the thing hot right now. We got a tattoo gun made out of a pen right over here. Right. Like, yeah, 1994. That's our year. Yeah. Down with the angels. So that year, the outlaws went on this violent nationwide spree with a ton of bombings and attacks on Hells Angels clubs and hangouts and all their affiliated allies. Over the next several months, the outlaws carried out two bombings of Midwest Hells Angels clubhouses and two clubhouses belonging to the Angels Florida allies, the Warlocks. In June 1994, the outlaws attended an event at an Indiana Speedway, and they expected that the Invaders Club would be there, who were, of course, allies with the Hells Angels. The night before the event, Taco met with various outlaws leaders to plan out how they were going to go about this attack on the Invaders. They decided to use what they call a war wagon, which is a vehicle modified with steel plating and gun ports so that they could basically roll up, put the weapons out of the ports, and surprise the invaders with this heavy artillery assault. You remember, it's, it's what he takes the kids to school in, the war right. wagon. Good old war wagon. <laughs> yeah. It's got plenty of room for all the kids going to the soccer games. You can fit soccer equipment there. You could fit guns there. Put a body in the trunk. It's perfect. It's all good. For any occasion. It's all good. The real surprise was that the invaders actually never showed up to the event. So the war wagon turned around and headed back home. Bummer. Right? I bet they were so disappointed. So bummed out. Because they expected to just go ham on some invaders. They were going to snipe these people out the side of it. It's so crazy. Gun ports. What? Nuts. On the road home, the war wagon was pulled over by police. <laughs> this is the greatest saga, getting this thing home. Crazy, right? What? Can you imagine being that cop? Like, what is that dash cam footage like? Riding behind the wagon. Mm-hmm. Just slowly cruising, right? Like, something looks really fishy. Something's weird here. So the officers seized firearms and ammunition, and smoke grenades from inside the war wagon. And of course, they arrested the outlaws that were inside the vehicle. In November 1994, Taco ordered the bombing of the Hell's Henchmen Clubhouse in Chicago because, of course, they were allied with the Hell's Angels. The bomb damaged the neighboring buildings and nearby cars, but it failed to destroy the actual clubhouse itself. So they went back a few days later and they doused the Hell's Henchman Clubhouse in gasoline and set it on fire. In the fall of 1994, Hell's Angels member Michael Mad Mike Quayle got into a gunfight with outlaw member Walter Buffalo Wally Posnack, and both men actually died in the gunfight. Buffalo Wally, by the way, is my absolute favorite biker name to date really that i've read so far yes buffalo wally it's i'm just, sticking with harry taco <laughs> you know yeah there's there's some sort of a charm to harry taco but <laughs> buffalo wally is great because i'm like did he have like native american bloodline the buffalo and then yeah, wally something. all i can think of every time i hear wally is wally world and the moose so it's just like touching on all these things for me and i'm like oh my gosh how excited how fun buffalo wally i can't take him seriously i think i like the just weird names like the one dirt <laughs> yeah well <laughs> i love dirt dirt's amazing and also <laughs> just kind of shit that doesn't make sense like the previous president who was harry staircase yeah, Where did Star that come Staircase from? Harry, because I think this guy was Harry, Harry, what was it again? It's Harry Clam, Harry, Harry Taco. Taco. It's Harry Taco, I keep saying that. Harry Taco. <laughs> so we need to distinguish between Harry Staircase and Harry Taco. But where did Staircase come from? Maybe like fell down the stairs. I like things that are confusing. I, I like that I want house, to know. It was like, oh, is it Harry up the stairs? Yeah, he's up the staircase. Oh, it's directions to the house. Something stupid like that. Because I call people like one arm. 
<laughs> right? The guy that I see in my neighborhood with the fedora, that's fedora. <laughs> right? So like You also have a guy called Blown Off Hands. <laughs> God rest his soul. But yes, he was formerly called Blown Off Hand. He's Yes. He, <laughs> Every time I come over, Courtney has these stories yeah. about local whoever's walking on the streets. And you do. You have nicknames. You have basically biker nicknames for all the characters in your neighborhood. It's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of them. That's why I'm so like, oh, God, I got to keep reading about my life. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just just the bizarro stuff that goes on at the, the where I live. Yeah. I mean, we had a live car accident while we were recording last week that we yeah. had to edit out full scale kids in the back full on just ambulances everything it's chaos here yeah your neighborhood is absolutely insane but it's fun for me because i just run to the window <gasps> what's going on oh my gosh we got one we yeah. got one last week we were in the middle of recording yeah. and we stopped because they pulled a baby out of the back window broke the back of window broke the baby out of the seat and the two other kids just spilled out i mean three kids in the back seat of this tiny little car and the van, it was like a tweaker van full of trinkets and his things were just spilling out and that's what he was so concerned about. And the other guy tried to assimilate into the crowd because he was like, we're going down. Like, this is a bad day for us now. <laughs> that was a great people watching experience. Yeah. And that's what your neighborhood's like. It's just a bunch of... That was like a Thursday. Like biker nickname. Yeah. You know? It's true. <laughs> Oh, God. So after Mad Mike and Buffalo Wally got in this gunfight and both passed away, they, of course, had this big funeral for each of the members. And biker funerals are kind of legendary because they're huge. All the members ride out. You know, it's a big event. So in the newspaper article about the Hells Angels funeral, Harry saw a picture of members of their ally club named Fifth Chapter hugging the Hells Angels members that were mourning. Dun, dun, dun. The plot thickens. Right? The fifth chapter club was actually this just regular, like, co-ed, family-oriented group, and their club was based on the foundation that all members were recovering from substance abuse problems. They weren't one percenters at all. No, they were like a support group. Exactly. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. I, I think that makes more sense, like this community of people, like let's do something positive and keep ourselves straight and clean and be there for our families. Absolutely. Instead of bombing people in 94. They were completely the opposite of the outlaws. Because they weren't one percenters, the fifth chapter stayed pretty neutral and the outlaws allowed them to stay in Florida without really fucking with them, even though the state was considered outlaw territory. Other outlaw gangs, they would definitely go on a full-on assault to get them disbanded or kicked out or whatever. They weren't a threat because they weren't selling drugs because right. they're substance-free. So, yeah, they're no threat whatsoever. Yeah. There's nothing that they're going to give the Hells Angels for being in Florida. So, whatever. It's cool. So, basically, they were allies. They got along. Everything was cool until this funeral. Harry was just livid that the fifth chapter chose to go to the Hells Angels funeral, just period. And on top of that, because they extended their condolences to someone that shot one of the outlaws members. So even though they were allowed the privilege of existing in outlaws territory, Harry completely decided they have to go at this point if they're going to be Hells Angels sympathizers. So Harry ordered his right-hand lieutenant, Wayne Hicks, to put an end to the 5th Chapter Club. Again, members of the 5th Chapter were invited to the Outlaws Clubhouse for a meeting, and about 15 of those members showed up that day. I get why they showed up. Like, they don't know about the murders and the things. They're not serious club members in that regard. They're not one percenters. Of course they come to the meeting. I get that. Yeah, I'm sure this came completely out of the blue. They never thought that what they were doing could offend them at all. They never thought they could get in trouble for it. So why not go to a meeting? You when know? I hear this, I don't start yelling like I do at other people like, why are we going to this meeting? But for them, I'm like, oh, OK, they're just going to the meeting. Like, I understand that. Yeah, they don't think that they did anything wrong. No. They know that they're not really stepping on outlaws toes with any of their club activities so why would they think anything suspicious side note fuck this 
Joe Black guy, by yeah. the way, because what does it matter that these non one percenters are, you know, hanging around and this and that? It's the, it, the only reason biker code. That's it. That's it. And your stupid fucking name is Joe Black. Is that from the Brad Pitt movie where he's deaf? Remember that? Meet <laughs> That's Joe what Black. I thought the first time I was like, Joe Black. That's and this, Brad I Pitt. Think, this is like circa Gwyneth Brad Pitt, where he's like really, really blonde. tan and blonde and very like Nordic looking during this period. Yes. And he's got that black suit on in the in the uh, movie poster, and I can see it. Meet Joe Black, and he's deaf, and he shows up. So like, really, that's what you're bringing to the table here. I hate this guy. And he's another Wayne, by the way. Yeah. Oh, totally. What? All these Waynes <laughs> up in this area. Biker assholes. It's a Wayne biker name. That's for sure. So when the fifth chapter members arrived for the meeting, they were searched and then seated at these two picnic tables. They were then shown that picture from the newspaper and berated for their transgression while being beaten with bats and chains. I'm sure that they were caught completely off guard, even when the picture was pulled out. I'm sure they just thought, I don't really see the problem here, right? I'm sure they were completely just like, wait, wait, why are we're here for that? Yeah, it must have been a huge shock. They probably just figured it was like chapter meeting. Oh, we're going to include them in this meeting that we're having. We always have it every year. We'll just include them. Whatever, you know? Or like, like that. we're letting you know about some local stuff going on or something. We're going to be making or, reservations for the toy drive parking spaces. Shit like that, right? Exactly. The fifth, RVs. The fifth chapter was a club that was definitely more positive. Maybe they thought it was a planning for some sort of, you know, fundraiser. An event. Yeah. yeah. Family event, maybe something like that. Sure, we'll show up. And they're just like, why don't you uh, just have a seat right there? Well, Chris Hansen style, right? <laughs> Catch a predator and just uh, have a seat right there. And they slap down this newspaper. I mean, it just must have been really jarring. So, I, I mean, they were caught completely off guard. I feel really bad for the fifth chapter members because they too. really got blindsided here. Yeah. After they just completely brutalized them with these bats and chains, they basically made the fifth chapter members clean themselves up and even shower before leaving the Outlaws Clubhouse compound. As they were leaving, they ordered them to return directly to their homes without stopping to discuss the events with each other or without stopping for any medical attention at a hospital. Okay. This happens. We go to a we go to this clubhouse meeting. We have now been beaten with bats and chains and they tell us we can't stop at the hospital. Okay, cool. Like seriously we're going to the nearest urgent care and we're getting Beeline. the cash price we're getting the cash price and we're using fake names and you know we can do this without leaving paper trail the fuck yeah biker code i'm sorry i forgot oh it's biker code yeah it's insane to me that they would follow those orders like you need medical intention repeatedly people are just taking what they say putting the biker club over their own well-being and safety. These aren't even one percenters. The poor chapter. That's even, yeah, makes it even worse. Poor fifth chapter. They were also instructed to immediately send the outlaws all of their fifth chapter memorabilia upon arriving home. Around the same time, Harry found out that an outlaw named Donald Fogg had become a police informant. So he ordered a hit on Donald. He also requested in that hit that the murderer make it look like an enemy had done it. Isn't that just, you know, part of the contract at this point? Isn't that like written in? I mean, I feel like that fuck. has to go unsaid because they say that every time. Just make, make it, it look like, like the, the Hell's, Hell's Angels, Angels did, did it. it. <laughs> yeah, every time. And how often is that even working for them? It never works. That's the thing. Like, how are you still taking that approach when it never fucking works ever? It must have worked once. And then they just repeat the story in the in these meetings and these clubhouses and these, you know, festivals. They're not so bright. They all get together and they're just out. like, let's stick with that tactic. Remember in 62 when we got that away with it? That one time it yeah. worked. They did it. We can too. Like, <laughs> All right. So a few weeks later, Donald Fogg was kidnapped and walked out to a field near the outlaw's clubhouse, and he was shot execution style in the head. 
he was found laying face down in the snow a short time later. After the murder, Donald Fogg was given a full traditional outlaw's funeral. It's just an unbelievable fact to me because they just played it off and pretended like they weren't involved in killing this man. I was just saying, I was just in my head, just like, these assholes. It's so heartless. It's even worse. Like the cover up to me is usually worse than the crime. But like in this case, this is a really, really fucked up cover up. Very brutal. The rumor that circulated was that a cop who wanted to steal Donald's girlfriend had actually shot him. Some people, of course, did put it together that it was weird that Taco didn't try and get revenge on the person rumored to have killed Donald. Usually there would be some retaliation immediately. And so it was suspicious. But of course, over time, the heat died down and nobody thought anything of it. Taco was super vindictive. Yes. I mean. So it was completely out of character for him completely to not out of character. attack the person rumored to have killed Donald. Yeah. When the dust settled after the murder, it was confirmed that Donald Fogg had indeed been cooperating with the police. They did it. Yeah. It just seems like you would know right away yeah. who would have the most to gain, who has the motive. Wouldn't the outlaws members put it together that taco did it but of course the biker code their feeling about snitches there's no way that they would turn on him for this they totally agreed with the decision i'm sure that same year taco ordered a hit on hell's angels international president sunny barger and he was the one i don't know if you guys remember that we talked about for the hell's angels altamont episode that we did the first Letter B Bikers episode. Yes. He was the one that had some quotes about how um, they don't deny membership to black people that apply. However, there's enough racist members to where no black people will ever get into the Hells Angels. That would be correct. That was his quote. I feel like um, Taco got a little big for his britches here going after Sonny Barger. Yeah, he's definitely punching up on this one because oh, yeah. Sonny is a huge figure within not only the Hells Angels, but just bikers overall. If you he's like the Sunny, spokesperson for bikers. Yeah, if, if you come for Sonny, you come for every single Hells Angel individually. This is for real. Hells Angels are not fucking around. And of no. course, they'd all say, well, neither are the outlaws. Neither are the warlocks. But I feel like Hells Angels is a little different. It's totally different. It's I agree. A little more serious. Way more serious. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> so, of course, I mean, this was a huge deal. Harry knew it was a huge deal, you know. He was intending to make a statement by attacking the Hells Angels on their own turf in California. Oh, it's 94. That's right. We're making a statement this right. year. We're wearing bright colors. <laughs> We're wearing bright colors for the fall, which is not normal. We're making a statement in 94. <laughs> He also wanted to attack Sonny Barger's closest lieutenant, George Christie. A couple trusted outlaws were selected to head out to California and do some surveillance and come up with a plan to attack them. But nothing ended up happening to Sonny. Taco had to abandon his plans to attack Sonny because he suddenly needed to lay low. After his right-hand man, Wayne Joe Black Hicks, turned informant. Oh, you mean meet Joe Black as a dick face? Shocking. I'm so surprised. Fuck this guy. <laughs> I just didn't like him. From the, I, I'm like, Joe Black, I know. Why? 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 Go back in your files, brain. I'm just like, oh, that stupid movie. This guy's dumb. It's like, nope. you know what it would be like? Remember on Touched by an Angel? The guy, the guy, the angel of death. It'd be like if you named yourself that, like, I'm so tough because I'm the angel of death. But it's like, mm, no, you're not really that tough. If you're that tough, you don't have to claim it because you is, just are it. This is tan. Brad if you're Pitt. that tough, your name is probably Taco or Wiener and you're just a complete psychopath. <laughs> Buffalo Wally and Dirt are the toughest ones here. No question to me. I'm way more scared of people that have just way really more. silly dismissible names because you know they're the craziest ones. Yeah. They're making it counterintuitive. They're making it like, oh, we can pass because, oh, I'm just taco. You know, nobody's scared of taco until you get murdered by him. 
Nobody's afraid yeah. of dirt. So after he turned informant, a warrant was issued for Taco's arrest. And Wayne was set to be, of course, the star witness against him in court. So Harry went on the run. And he evaded police by traveling all over the U.S. and hiding out. And of course, there's all these clubhouses. There's all these members trying to protect him. It seems like it's pretty easy for a biker to just lay low for a while and travel around and be hidden because various members are protecting him. It's like the clubs throughout the U.S. are pre-set up safe houses. Safe houses. For anyone hiding to go, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. After almost two years on the run, specifically 22 months, Harry was escalated to number two on the FBI's most wanted list. It seemed that the law would never catch up to Taco because so much time had passed. But ultimately, it was actually his inability to keep it in his pants that became his eventual downfall. I'm going to say this quote from this old lady about prostitution. Yeah, it seemed like women were often the downfall of most outlaws. There are a lot of issues with their relationships with women. Well, these aren't just like look the other way chicks. She's not going quietly into that good night. Uh uh. Mm mm. No, side piece is not quiet here. So there's this one chick on this Gangland episode that she she's seen some, you know, rough days. She's had some rough times. Back of bike makes you a little leathery. And <laughs> she looks at the camera and she just goes, if you took away all the old ladies, they'd be in trouble because I don't think they know how to work. Old lady says. Right. But it's because the outlaws apparently are most likely to pimp their women is what the FBI agent says. That it's always, if there's a prostitution ring, pimping, it's the outlaws. Mm. So I think it's really funny that this one woman who's like a serious, serious worker for the gang is just like, if it wasn't for us, you'd be fucked. Yeah. I'm Pretty sure funny. there is a lot of protection that they provide and a lot of the work that they do, even though it's clearly a misogynistic, just male-based group. So knowing about that, knowing that this is their their gig, if you will, it was probably super easy to be in these safe houses across the country with all these different chicks that they've installed, if you will, in different places. Parking yeah, rides. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like all over the place. So you can just jump from place to place and stay on the run for a long time. And everywhere you go, there's all these brothers that take care of you and all these women. Yeah, it's just not surprising that women would be his downfall because no. it seems like there's so many stories, especially with outlaws and their unhealthy, let's say, relationships with women. Unhealthy is a good word for it. Criminal might be better. <laughs> it would be more accurate. Sure. So... Taco was pulled over for speeding outside of Las Vegas in a convertible Mercedes. And at the time, he was with a young blonde who was in the passenger seat. He's not even hiding. No. By the way. Like, he's just out there in a convertible. Flipping him off through the, you know, with no roof. But his version of hiding was that he presented the officers with a fake ID. And... Nothing really popped up for them, I guess, when they ran the license plate and the ID. So they sent him on his way without any issue. Amazing. The number two FBI most wanted man in the world. It's crazy. The information that I found, I don't know if he even got a speeding ticket or anything. It sounds like they just sent him on his way. Like, hey, man, slow down. Yeah. That's it. That's what everything I saw was just basically like, here's your warning. But sometime later, the puzzle pieces were put together and it was discovered that this was indeed Harry Taco Bowman that the officers had pulled over. Detectives realized that even though he had got away, they actually did have a play here to make because not only did Harry have a wife, but he had several girlfriends spread around the U.S. while he was on the run. It's awful. It's it's not nice for me to say this, but basically there's just like STD ridden folks, just lot lizards of we don't discriminate all different kinds just installed in parking rides and freaking rest stops everywhere as far as you can see. And when those people are wronged, they will fuck your shit up. Yeah. Betrayal is huge. Oh, it's going bad for you. If those people turn... It's over. 
because yeah. this is our interstate, you know, the charges you could just see him racking up like a cash register. Ding, ding, ding. Harry had been a well-known ladies' man, and although the people close to him knew that he was quite a womanizer, it seems that some of the women he was sleeping with actually believed that they were the only one. So detectives got the footage from the police cruiser dash cam and zoomed in on a picture of the young blonde passenger. They took that picture and showed it to Harry's main side piece back in Detroit, and she had a complete meltdown. This is not worth your hysteria, ma'am. No, right? <laughs> like, settle down, for real. Can you imagine the officers trying to pretend to feign empathy at this moment? So they I'm feel bad because currently. they know they need to get information from her. Yeah. But really, they're just laughing at her situation. Yeah. Because yeah. how do you not know? I mean, oh, my God. Yeah, you know Taco is with other women, but... Every story. Apparently, like- she didn't, though. But she was pissed. She cussed and called him some choice names for a short while. But then detectives say that she gave up information within five minutes of seeing the photos. Five minutes? Yeah, it was quick. <laughs> five minutes? She flipped quick. Not worth getting upset about because five minutes later, you're like, all right, motherfuckers, give me a notepad. <laughs> Right. right. Like, why Clearly, are you it's not your soulmate. No, no, we're moving on up. Like, <laughs> we are not staying with Harry Taco. <laughs> so give me a notepad and get me a new name. So she let them know that Taco was paranoid about wiretaps and being on the phone. So he was coming home to throw a barbecue and have a meeting with the high ranking outlaws leadership. The girlfriend also gave up the address and authorities did a federal raid of his Sterling Heights, Michigan home on the late afternoon of June 7th, 1991. I also saw something about how she, when she started cooperating, they, uh, she said, you know, he's paranoid about bugs and he always thinks he's being listened to and that they had a bug in the lamp in the house. They had her planted, I think. It was like in this lamp on the side. So they were just getting everything the whole time. That's the thing is usually paranoia is unfounded. There's no. no reason for it. But here in the biker world, in the mafia world. You can always justify you're right. paranoia, okay? It's in the lamp. You can find a way. It's yeah. in the lamp. I hear it. It's in my soles, soles of my shoes. All of it, right? When he was captured, he had long hair, a long beard, and a fresh tan. So he was clearly covering up his appearance because like we said before, he was relatively clean cut for a biker. He changes his appearance a lot, though, because there's a lot of pictures of him where he's full on biker with long hair, beard, you know, bandanas on. And then there's other ones where his hair is a little shorter. He almost looks like a Richard Ramirez with mm-hmm. some Jim Jones glasses. It's an interesting combo. So it's kind of weird because pictures you see, he just his appearance looks different every time. Yeah, it was clear throughout his entire position of presidency. He was... Complete chameleon, like I yeah. said. I mean, he was one day just a completely different person. The next day, barely recognizable. Going between, you know, legitimate world, you know, high society parties, and then dirty, grimy biker bars. Yeah, he's taken off his long sleeve shirt and showing off his Nazi forearm, but then just throws on a suit jacket. Yeah, it really worked to his advantage, though. He, sure did. for many years, just worked seamlessly in both worlds. He was charged with several racketeering counts, drug distribution, conspiracy to murder various bikers, bombing of various clubhouses, and assault. He was also charged with two counts of kidnapping for the separate incidents with Erwin Neeson, Hitler, and Kevin Talley, plus individual murder charges for Raymond Chafin and Don Fogg. His trial began in Florida in 2001. The defense, of course, tried to say that the individual outlaws members had acted alone and were not orchestrated by Taco. His lawyers insisted that the murders and drug deals and various bombings were not ordered by Taco, and he had no prior knowledge of any of these attacks. So if that's true, then everyone around him is just a nutcase. They all do the same sort of thing, but no, it's all individual. There's too many parallels here. It's just a ridiculous argument. They have so many policies like that. You know, well, we all did the exact same thing, but we're all different. 
not we're all the acting case. alone. Yeah, that's not crazy. The case. So of course the jury saw right through it, and he was convicted of thirteen racketeering counts, several bombing incident counts, kidnapping of Erwin Neeson and Kevin Talley, and the murder of Raymond Chafin. Harry was sentenced to two concurrent terms of life imprisonment plus 20 years on three additional charges and a few 10-year charges. So there was a total of two concurrent life sentences plus 83 years. He was also ordered to pay 18 grand in restitution to the widow of Raymond Chafin. It's not enough money. No. 18 grand is a joke. When I saw that, I was floored. My jaw just dropped. I was like, that's nothing. It's not I enough. I mean, this poor woman. You see a lot of cases where they're ordered to pay a million, two million, something that seems almost outlandish, but it's not. It's not crazy. This is the death of her, you know, life partner. They pay out when they don't even know who killed the person sometimes. Right. And this one, it's like, we know who did it. This and the, we have all the details. Yeah, 18 grand. No, 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 no. It seems to minimize the, you know, severity Very of what happens. So. Very much so. So, of course, he appealed his convictions and his lawyers argued that the district court violated his rights by refusing to disclose the jurors' names and by refusing to redact the outlaw's constitution that included that clause about their whites-only membership policy. And I saw that there were many instances before this where they had gone to do juror intimidation. So anytime there were cases where the names of the jurors were included, the outlaws attacked those jurors. So there was definitely a reason why the judge ordered for these names to be not included. He was really protecting the safety of those individuals. Yeah, it's a safety issue. It's it not, really you know, is. You know, it, it, this is about physical safety. They kill everybody. Everyone. <laughs> I mean. It really is ridiculous that they would try and use this as an excuse to get an appeal, you know? It just doesn't make sense when they have clearly had a history of violence against jurors. There's a pattern. There's just no basis for that appeal. He also challenged the sufficiency of the evidence, which is the only thing that I do understand because most of these crimes with no bikers coming forward to talk about it had a severe lack of forensics because of the time that had gone by, had a lack of witnesses, but still there was definitely enough to convict him there. It's mostly other bikers that are cooperating and circumstantial evidence. And if you look at it illegally, you're like, oh, shit. Yeah, this is not enough. But it's a big picture. It's a whole, per, you know, it's a long term pattern yeah, it's, of violence. It's a hard one. You know who I think really has like won here? Sonny Barger. He'll, he's out. He literally he dodged a bullet on like, this one. Just chilling. He's fine. He was on an episode of Sons of Anarchy. Oh, yeah. He's just hanging out. He's doing just consulting. He is the face of bikers. He is the celebrity biker. And he can just wear like a Santa onesie and show up to a rally and give out toys and they'll forget all the shit 40, 50 years ago now that went down. You know, he was at Altamont. You know, I mean, there's a lot there. We talked about it. But realistically, biker world, Sonny Barger's who you want to be. Yeah. He's going to fall asleep one night. In his warm bed with his wife and kids and grandkids, fine. And he's just going to go to sleep and that's it for him. And he's going to be fine. Whereas like all these other people are serving two life terms and, you know, are dead in the snow. It's not Sonny Barger. Yeah, there's something that Sonny Barger is doing right because Taco is just one of many leaders within the biker world that is held accountable for his actions when Sonny has never been held accountable for his actions. Yeah, it's crazy. So Taco's appeals were, of course, rejected, and he remains in prison until this day, unlike Sonny. Do you think that there's outlaws that are, like, supporting, putting money on his books still and writing him letters every day like they're supposed to? I would think so. I am sure of it. He's officially a lounge lizard now. He is a lounge lizard. So that's the story of Harry Taco and the outlaws. And his restaurant. <laughs> I really think you should just... 
go for that. He missed the mark not going into the restaurant business really for sure. Really did. Yeah. So that's it for bikers. Yeah. Letter B is done. No more bikers. We're moving on to letter C next week. One thing I do want to do, though, is if we ever are just bored and able, we really should visit Peace Arch Park. Yes. It, we talked about it last with week Wayne in the shut-in massacre. Yes. That's the biker area between the U.S. border and Canada border so that there's a ton of meetings there Yep, discussing all this outlaw activity, this one percenter planning. Like, I'm completely done with the biker stories. Done. But I still have a ton of curiosity about the biker world. Yeah. Yeah. There's still a bunch of stuff. But I'm done for the moment. We can take that trip next year or something. We I need a biker break right now. Take a break. <laughs> no more patches. No more old ladies. I'm ready for something different. It's a lot. So, like I said, next week we'll be back with letter C. And before we get out of here, we again wanted to say thank you to our new Patreon members. So this week we have new patrons, Flora, Alexandra, Evelyn, Diana, and Lindsay. Thank you so much. So thanks so much, you guys, for signing up on our Patreon. And again, we've got a whole bunch of links in our show notes before we get out of here. We've got links to the research material. I don't have the link to the Outlaws episode, but I'm definitely going to put that information in it, there. It's also very simple. It's on YouTube, Gangland. Season two, episode three, it's called The Biker Wars. We'll put it up there. So if you want to watch that, if you want to read some more articles, we'll put those links in the show notes. We'll also have links to our social media if you want to get information and follow us there, join the discussion with us. And um, I think that's pretty much it. The links to our Threadless and Patreon are in our show notes. And Courtney's got, she's all over this new phone case and a sweater. Yeah. I am. <laughs> I really am. Murder dictionary everywhere. So if you want to be like Courtney, definitely check out our Threadless. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much it. We'll be back next week starting off letter C. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week. Bye. Hi, true crime fans. I'm Erin. And I'm Shay. We host All Crime No Cattle, a conversational podcast which focuses on true crime stories from the Lone Star State. We strive to bring you a balanced and well-researched story about Texas cases big and small. We do the research so you don't have to. We also end every episode with a good news story, just to remind everyone that real life isn't quite as depressing as true crime can make it out to be. New episodes drop every Thursday, and you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. All crime, no cattle, because crime is bigger in Texas, y'all. Hi, I'm Brianna. And I'm Courtney. From Crime Screen Podcast. Where every week we talk about movies, TV shows, and docuseries based on true crimes. We discuss all the bingeable and unforgettable true crime that we're all watching on our screens at home. Like Making a Murderer, Mommy Dead and Dearest, or Dear Zachary. So if you're like us and have the problem of scaring off people at parties with serial killer facts and true crime stories, or you just try to talk about whatever you watched and get horrified looks from coworkers and even your exasperated significant other, then we are your new friends to discuss all the true crime with. Follow Crime Screen Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay updated. And subscribe to Crime Screen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. here and Old Navy's got all the styles you need right now with up to 50% off store-wide.
Hurry in for the season's biggest trends, like Rockstar jeans and frost-free jackets on sale. Jeans start at just 18 bucks for adults, 12 bucks for kids. Plus, get warm and stylish outerwear for just 18 bucks for adults, 17 bucks for kids. Want to save even more? Redeem your super cash now through Sunday. Hurry in now for up to 50% off store-wide at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 1026 through 113. Select styles only. The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Old moon, yeah. That's Hugo, tickling the ivories. He just saved by bundling home and auto with Progressive. Gonna finally buy a ring for that gal of yours, Hugo? Send him my condolences. hi oh. This next one's for you, too. There's a burglar in my heart. Thank you. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations.